Shalom to the elect of Israel, to the hopefully elect of Israel, you Hebrew Israelites, you so-called Negroes, Latinos, Native Americans, West Indian and Haitians, that give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, which is the Most High Name, Bahashim, Yahweh Shah, Yahweh Shah is his son name, his only begotten son. They give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashim, Yahweh Shah, Bahashim. Rekha Kodash, which is the Holy Spirit. Double honors to the apostles and elders of great millstone who rule well, who teach well. And the sincere salutation to all the ark and pushing this truth and believing this truth throughout the four winds of the earth, the entire world, working up the hopefully elect. And shalom to the Awa who are listening and learning, the few sisters who are listening and learning. I'm Isaiah, coming into another lesson in true facts, faith, and edification, another daily edification. Lord's willing, needs to be edified. And this is a couple of new clips I'm going to play. <clears throat> Just showing you what's going on. While Jake is around here sleeping and worrying about what's on Facebook and all these social media sites. Okay, judgment is playing out. Prophecies are speaking. So Lord witness be edifying. Been busy on the Twitter machine today. And just moments ago, President Trump warning Iran against striking any American assets saying the U.S. has, quote, targeted 52 Iranian sites representing the 52 American hostages taken by Iran many years ago, some at a very high level and important to Iran and the Iranian culture. And those targets and Iran itself will be hit very fast and very hard. The USA wants no more threats. Republican Congressman from Kansas Steve Watkins is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, also a veteran of Iraq and the U.S. Army. Congressman, uh, there has been a lot of hand-wringing over the death of Qasem Soleimani. What's your take? Well, John, let's remember that this is great news. Uh, first, we not only took a powerful piece off the chessboard, but also uh, we're, we're moving from an Obama uh, policy of uh, conciliatoriness over to uh, Donald Trump, which wants to reestablish deterrence and reestablish us as a credible threat. And that's so imperative, especially those who have, of us who have been tactical on the ground, and we, we understand the importance. Now, Iran will continue to escalate and uh, that, climb up that ladder of escalation, um, but we, we need to focus on um, our mission, which is clear. Uh, one thing that the uh, Secretary of State has said is that we have a clear and deep mission. That's to promote peace and prosperity throughout the region, do it by, with, and through our allies, using our military uh, force if need be, pre preferably economic information, diplomacy, uh, and the like. Well, obviously, the Iraqis are, are threatening now to um, push U.S. troops out of that country as a result of this airstrike. Um, Iraq, in some sense, uh, in some regards, being a sort of a puppet state to Iran these days. What if that were to happen? What if all U.S. forces get kicked out of Iraq as a result of all this? You know how much uh, blood and treasure the United States has spent there. Would that be worth it? Well, I, I saw the statements of Prime Minister Abdul Mahdi, and, and kind of like uh, Secretary Pompeo, I, I believe that he knows uh, the actual situation is uh, he and many of his people want the United States there. In fact, that there were, uh, there were demonstrators um, uh, rejoicing over the fact of, that uh, we killed Swam, uh, Swamani. And, um, and so I, it will be there. I, unfortunately, I think it's a soft target. We are going to get a retaliatory attack from Iran. Um, looking at uh, the battle space, that's probably where it'll happen. It's unfortunate. I've been on the ground there, and, uh, and my heart goes out uh, to, uh, to the soldiers and, and, uh, and the individuals and the diplomats and the contractors. There. But uh, we're certainly going through a tough time right now. But I point out that um, action in the uh, short term does take risk, but inaction in the long run is even more risky. A lot of Democrats are upset, maybe even angry at the president over this strike. I, I want to read a statement from Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia. He wants to see the War Powers Resolution uh, fired, filed. He says, we owe it to our service members to have a debate and vote about whether or not it's in our national interest to engage in another unnecessary war in the Middle East. Um, in your view, is what the... Hey, that's prophecy, man. Okay? Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shah is gathering all these nations into the valley of Yahweh Shapat, man. 
Okay, that's prophecy. It has nothing to do with you people, man. Okay, Proverbs 21 and 1 said, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, man. Just like the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. The president did tantamount to starting a war? No, John, listen, I, I've heard the Democrats' response. First, they were talking about elements of just war theory, for example. Um, I, are, I have, was it a proportionate response? I heard that. Uh, I also heard, what did he have the authority? He absolutely had the authority. Now, uh, this this uh, insurgent, that's what he was, is a combatant in Iraq. It killed hundreds of American service members. And so we had every bit the right, and uh, I'd be happy to debate that with any Democrat in the House. The argument, though, is that you, you cut the head off the snake, but the snake remains alive, and that, and that it'll just grow a new head. What about that? Well, one of the things about uh, Sulmani is that um, one of the things he, he added was these personal relationships that he had with Hezbollah in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, particularly Al Ambar. And um, you, you take away him as an individual. A lot of those, uh, a lot of their efficacy depends on that personal relationship that they have with him. So that's what he brought to the fight. You take him away, it's 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 more than just a position. I mean, he's kind of a folk hero, as we see. Um, and so that's it's it's a huge victory for us. And, a, and again, we need to uh, reestablish ourselves as a credible threat. And that's something the pride that of the heart. I have to see them. A lot of people uh, for whom I try and make sense at the strategic level. I take it down to the tactical level. Those of us who are on the ground with assault rifles and sat phones and our mission or our work, we we want them to believe that if anything were to happen to us, then a precision guided hellfire missile from a Reaper drone was gonna come raining down on them. That's what we did and that's the fear that we set in place all, hmm. all over the country. If you're a battle captain um, in Yemen who's an insurgent or, or say um, in, in Hezbollah, keep in mind that if we can take out your general, then we can certainly take you out. Steve Watkins is a Republican uh, member of that's the that's the pride of Esau, man. That's the pride of Esau. And hello again, everybody. I'm Rick Sanchez. Tonight, it seems the entire world is on edge as uh, the United States has essentially taken out an Iranian official. Um, as we all uh, collectively hold our breaths it seems the question to be asked is now what is next as we begin this uh, special report what i want to do is uh, take you around and introduce you to some of the folks who we are going to uh, be hearing from today uh, ron paul Former uh, U.S. Uh, congressman is going to be joining us uh, via satellite. We also have uh, Scott Ritter, uh, weapons inspector, uh, very much known for his expertise in this particular region, who is going to be joining us as well. You see on the screen there as well from uh, Tehran live is uh, Mohammed uh, Morandi, the University of Tehran professor, who's going to give us his perspective. And uh, here on the set, we have with us uh, Christy I our uh, boom boss uh, host uh, to tell us what's going on with the markets as a result of this. Michelle Greenstein, who is uh, taking us through what the global reactions are from all over the world. And then uh, Max Blumenthal, the editor of uh, The Gray Zone, is uh, joining us here as well. And uh, Jim Jatras, who is a former uh, State Department official. All right, let's get started with, uh, with uh, Mohammed uh, Morandi. He's at the University of uh, Tehran. He has uh, been uh, following this story very carefully, as uh, all of his countrymen are. Uh, Professor Morandi, thank you, sir, for uh, taking time to join us. Let's start with this. What I think is maybe the most important question Thank to ask you. you, since it's what we have been hearing here, the U.S. position from the left, from the right, from the media, is that uh, Qasem Soleimani was a terrorist responsible for the deaths of hundreds and hundreds of Americans. How would you describe him? Well, Iranians see him as a hero. He not only was he a war hero, during the invasion of Saddam Hussein, uh, where the United States and the Europeans gave Saddam Hussein everything, including chemical weapons, and he was a key commander during that war, a volunteer. 
uh, but also after the United States began uh, supporting uh, extremist groups with the Saudis and Qatar and Turkey and Syria, and after tens of thousands of foreign fighters were, were brought into the country in 2013, he began to get involved to prevent the capital Damascus from falling into the hands of ISIS and uh, other such groups like Al Qaeda. And uh, they began to push these groups back there. And also in Iraq, when uh, ISIS spilled over into that country, the Americans had destroyed Iraq because of the, the wars, the sanctions, and of course the invasion. It was a broken country and there was no real resistance in the face of ISIS. So right when Baghdad, the capital, was about to fall, he went to the capital and uh, personally took charge of the defense of uh, the capital and ISIS forces reached the outskirts of that city. So uh, he and the, uh, the Iraqi commander, who was also murdered by the Americans, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, they were the two key figures, or two of the key figures that uh, saved Iraq and pushed ISIS back. L let me Iranians ask you... believe that if it wasn't for him, uh, these, the capitals of Iraq and Syria would have been held. Let me ask you a question. Let, let, let me ask you a second question that we're hearing here in the United States. Earlier today, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo came out and essentially said that the only reason we did this was to an, avert uh, an imminent attack uh, against the United States by your country. Although when he was asked to be specific, he had no specifics. What's your reaction to that? Well, first of all, the United States government behaves with arrogance. They are judge, jury, and prosecutor hmm. on the one hand. Second of all, Pompeo himself just a few months ago said that when in the CIA, we were taught to lie, to cheat, and to steal. And Thanks. that's what the United States did when they invaded Iraq in the first place. They fabricated intelligence uh, about weapons of mass destruction and uh, cooperation between Iraq and Al-Qaeda and justified their, their war and their destruction of the country. That's what the thieves say, man. Okay, St. John 10 and 10. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But also in addition to that, when the Americans wanted to strike the Iraqi target a couple of days ago and they wanted to kill the 30 young men who were on the Syrian border fighting ISIS, the, they, the uh, American Secretary of Defense called the Iraqi Prime Minister. The Prime Minister told him not to carry out the attacks. He was ignored. But also the Prime Minister told him to provide the Iraqis with the intelligence that they have. And he refused. Hmm. Why? Well, part of it is arrogance, and part of it is that there was no intelligence. So the United States, whenever they need to justify something, the government, they'll say something in the media will mimic whatever the State Department, the White House, or the Pentagon says. Final question to you, final question to you regarding the situation right now there in Iran. Uh, we have been seeing pictures, in fact, I don't know uh, if, uh, Peter, we might be able to put some of those uh, videos up of uh, these crowds that have been amassing around uh, Tehran today, apparently in mourning for, uh, for uh, the general's uh, death. The question is, is this, do you believe, going to unify Iran? Uh, especially based on Millions the came out, man. To you, we were talking about the Millions. Fact that people in Iran were essentially You see they waving that red uh, flag angry too. because of the economy there. That mean retaliation. They're having protests against the United Revenge. States. Well, the Iranians were very angry and I think they continue to be angry with the administration because of their uh, the the way in which they increased the price of fuel. But uh, General Soleimani has always been a very popular figure in Iran throughout this period, and even Western polls admit that. But uh, so yet, but he, it is it has united the country, and there are crowds and gatherings across the country, and I think the funeral the day after tomorrow will be enormous. But also, uh, tomorrow there will be a funeral in Iraq, and he will be uh, his body will be taken to a couple of the cities in the south of Iraq. And it's predicted that there will be huge crowds in Iraq, both for him and for 
Abdul Mahdi al Mohandas, the Iraqi commander that the Americans assassinated. And in fact, the Americans carried out an act of war on both Iraq and Iraq. But uh, I think that when the people see the crowds tomorrow, they'll discover that the narrative created by the United States, the Saudis and the Emiratis, that the Iraqi people hate Iran, I think that narrative will become, uh, will, will suffer a great deal. And they will see how Iraqis feel about General Soleimani and his role in saving their country. Mohammed Morandi, Professor, our thanks to you, sir, for taking time uh, to share your perspective there from uh, Tehran. Uh, thank now, you. thank you, sir. We're going to be joined now by our, our panel. Um, th this whole notion that suddenly what the United States has done may actually be uh, a unifying factor for the people of Iran is one that we probably should uh, take a good look at. Scott Ritter, I'm going to bring you in for this. Uh, do, do, do you think the, as you like to say in your field, the blowback or uh, the back Backfire here will be the fact that uh, we're actually going to coalesce uh, some forces in that region, specifically inside Iran and maybe beyond its borders as well. Well, first of all, let's 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 be straight. There was never a problem inside Iran, not one worthy of uh, mentioning in this context. The Iranian government is firmly in charge. Uh, there is some discontent about the economy, but it never rose to the level that threatened the viability of the Iranian government. So the notion that the death of General Soleimani is somehow going to coalesce the Iranian government is ludicrous. They were already coalesced. They already were unified in their uh, position against uh, you know, the American uh, posture uh, in the Middle East. The, the real danger here is that... Um, the United States probably tipped the balance in the Iraqi parliament to vote uh, for legislation that uh, kicks the Americans out of Iraq. Now, this has been a long time goal of the Iranian government to get the United States military out of Iraq. And thanks to President Trump, uh, we probably just facilitated that happening. The, yeah. the Iraqi government is very angry. The Iraqi parliament is poised to make a vote, and that vote will probably be for America to leave Iraq. Let's go to uh, Jim Jatras, uh, former uh, State Department uh, diplomat here. Uh, that's an interesting point that he made. you want to follow up on that? Yeah. The first question, I, I think Scott is exactly right, and the next question occurs to me is when they do vote for us to leave Iraq, will we actually leave? Uh, or will we insist on staying in basically it would be a resumed occupation role without even the fig leaf of having uh, the permission of the host government to have our forces there? Uh, I, I was listening to, on some of the other, you know, standard networks where congressmen were being asked about this and they were giving a kind of, oh, well, uh, that sort of remains to be seen, whether we would actually leave if they vote us out. Let's talk about what this actually was. Few people are actually using the word, but I think some are. An assassination, a hit. Is this our new foreign policy? Max this, is, this, this, this reminds me distinctly of Israel's mode of operation, particularly in the Gaza Strip. It reminds me of what they've done since the Second Intifada when they dropped a 2,000-pound bomb on a civilian apartment block to kill Salah Shahada, then the commander of the Al-Qassam Brigades, the armed wing of Hamas. But they're not dealing with a local militant group like Al-Qassam or Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They're dealing with a regional power, and Iran is going to do something to demonstrate just that back to the U.S. I don't think that Donald Trump realizes what he's just done. Michelle Greenstein, you've been working on the reaction that we're seeing from all over the world. What, what, what is the reaction from some of the big countries, you know, uh, Russia, China, uh, you know, different countries all over the world, Middle sure. East? The international reaction is pretty much what you'd expect. We have uh, Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif calling this an act of international terrorism and also an extremely dangerous and foolish escalation. We also have the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, warning that this is going to result in severe reset revenge from the Iranian side. Now, let's talk about the Iraqi reaction, because after all this happened on Iraqi soil, we have the Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi saying that this might spark a devastating war, which I would say is pretty significant because, of course, we're talking about a post-2003 Iraqi administration. Now, in terms of the broader global community. We have both the Chinese and Russian foreign ministries with warning not to increase tensions, saying that all parties should exercise restraint. But let's also talk about the Israeli reaction, because we also had Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who actually spoke with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo just hours before the assassination, praised the strike and claiming that it was an act of self-defense. Take a listen. Just as Israel has the right of self-defense, the United States has exactly the same right. Qasem Soleimani is responsible for the death 
of American citizens and many other innocent people. He was planning more such attacks. President Trump deserves all the credit for acting swiftly, forcefully, decisively. See, and that's what I was finna go, man. You see, this whole thing is cause of Benjamin Netan not a Jew, man. Okay? As the scriptures say, <clears throat> this is Jeremiah 50 and 45. Therefore, hear ye the counsel of the Lord Yahweh that ye have taken against Babylon and his purposes and his proposals that he have proposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with them. Okay? The least of the flock is who? The Israelis, man. They are making North America draw out to come fight for them, man. See, this had nothing to do with Trump, man. Trump just a puppet. Benjamin Ned, not a Jew. Okay? The Israelis, man. They are the least of the flock that's drawing North America out to fight, man. This all comes from um, Israel, man. So you have Israel kind of towing the Washington line, which is that this is an act of self-defense. But then you have the or United... Or is it vice versa? <laughs> right. I mean, that's the big Sorry. question, isn't it? But then you also have the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings calling that claim into question. Take a listen. Okay. Under international law, self-defense to be lawful will need to be invoked in situations where there is an imminent uh, attack against... Uh, the interest of the territory, in this case of the United States. At this point in time, the United States has not thus far provided any information uh, suggesting that there was an imminent uh, attack. Now, there's just one more reaction, if you want to call it, that I want to take a look at, and that's of the major U.S. weapons contractors. We had companies like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, all seeing their stock, interestingly enough, take a rise after this assassination. That's interesting. In fact, that, let's do this. Let's bring in Christy I. She's our uh, financial expert here at uh, RT America, and we use her a lot on the Rick Sanchez show. Um, you know, you always have to ask yourself in these situations, right, who stands to gain? Who stands to gain? Exactly, and the elites, man. Okay, starting with the Rothschild, man. They fund both sides of the war, man. That's who gained from these wars, man. The elites, starting with the Rothschild, the head family, man. Okay, them thirteen families who control the entire planet, the one percenters, they profit from these wars, man. So happy you brought that up because let's take a look at this heat map that we have here showing the current what the state of the current u.s equities market looks like in the past 24 hours so if you look at it global equities dropped around the world and you see this is like a sea of red with most of the majors such as tech and healthcare all falling but the big points of standout green are obviously on oil energy and utilities consumer staples which is a very safe stock and that light green up on the upper right hand corner which is all defense stock defense Northrop government Raytheon hmm. all the defense contractors wow. as well as manufacturers who are benefiting from this that's amazing it's almost like you can almost predict the pattern immediately exactly. after you saw this exactly right? and this shows that there's a tremendous risk off movement in the market because remember this is only the second trading day of 2020 so most of portfolio managers they positioned yesterday in preparing for this enormous trading rally that they've been all running into only to have the entire global equities market fall out from under them so now you see a massive repositioning and they're all moving into safety assets and currencies such as the Swiss franc, the Japanese yen, the Hong Kong dollar, as well as cryptocurrencies, which are all up over 5 and 10 percent. Scott Ritter, Max Blumenthal, you guys write and think about this all the time. What, 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 are, you, what are you thinking when you see suddenly that suddenly people are becoming multimillionaires overnight as a result of this? Max, why don't you get started? Then we'll go to Scott. I... I actually don't see a lot of strategic advantage here from a national security perspective. What we're looking at here is an extreme wing of the national security state, which has aligned itself tightly with the axis of extremism represented by Israel, particularly its Likud party and Netanyahu, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. And this axis is extremely upset 
that Qasem Soleimani managed to mobilize the Hashd al-Shabi, the popular mobilization units, and destroy ISIS, which was a pro in many ways a proxy force that supported their interests of destabilizing mm. the Middle East using uh, Wahhabi, Salafi, jihadi proxies. And so this is in many ways revenge, but it's also imperial hubris because Soleimani not only is one of the most popular figures in Iran, people are in the streets crying, crying because he's been killed. This is seen as an attack on all Shia people in the Middle East, and the U.S. doesn't know. I don't think they understand what they have just triggered. Scott Ritter, I want to bring you in on this conversation. What are you thinking about this uh, hit? How would you describe it to the American people so they can better understand it? Uh, an absolute, uh, unmitigated disaster uh, of a scale of which... Um, they are unable to comprehend at this point in time because right now it, it, it we don't see a cost i mean we're used to this we're used to seeing american forces deployed to the middle east we're used to seeing american drones take out high value targets but what we've never done is uh is felt the price has paid the consequences and uh you know the other thing is we have everybody standing by for an immediate attack that isn't going to happen the iranians are far smarter than this uh, the last thing they want is a uh, you know toe-to-toe -to -toe fight this is going to be a long, drawn-out, strategic defeat of the United States in the Middle East, beginning in Iraq, going hmm. into Syria, and we're going to see a retrograde of American power and influence in the region um, like we haven't ever seen before. It's, it's, a, a, it's a defeat of, uh, you know, of, of enormous proportions, and there will be economic consequences, geopolitical consequences. And uh, this is probably the least thought out military action undertaken by an American president um, in modern history. Could this hmm. thing lead to war? And if it does, do we win? Jim Jatras. Uh, in terms of inflicting a lot of damage on the Iranians, yes, of course, we could win in that sense. Will we achieve any strategic objectives? I don't think so. And I don't think we understand. I mean a, a war. I mean a mano a mano. Our troops, their troops. Can we win that war? We, we could win in a sense we can inflict a lot of damage on the Iranians. Can we achieve anything where we actually uh, have some objective that we've met? I don't think so. Scott, do you, no. do you do, quickly, Scott, before I go, because we have a special guest standing by, do you, what, what would your answer to that question be if somebody asked you, could we win a war against Iran? Look, the new Marine Corps commandant answered that question when he put out his mission statement. He said, we can no longer count on maritime amphibious forces being able to... <laughs> hey, these, hey, boy, they can't answer the question straight because they know they are lose, man. <laughs> Close with an enemy shore and debarking troops because they have standoff weapons that will sink our ships before they get close. The Iranians have those standoff weapons. This will, if we go to war, yeah, we'll conflict damage, but guess what? They will too. Joining us now, uh, the president of the Rock. <laughs> hey, these people that want to tell the truth, man. Hey, that's Esau, man. That's military jar jargon for, okay, we. Run this bet. From Studio 4 in the world headquarters of RT America in our nation's capital, this is the news with Rick Sanchez. And hello again, everybody. I'm Rick Sanchez. You know, Tonight, the world is in turmoil. And by the way, those are not my words. Those are the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations, who held a news conference this morning to echo what really most of us feel. He said, we are, quote, now living in dangerous times. And then he went on to say that the countries are taking, quote, uh, unpredicted decisions with unpredictable consequences and a profound risk of miscalculation. This from the United Nations. Now, take a look at uh, Tehran. These are pictures from Tehran in the last 40 years. Millions hours. of people showed up for that man's funeral. Look at that, man. Of humanity. Millions and millions of people. Millions, stretching man. Several miles have turned out to pray and mourn the loss of a man they seem to have revered. That man is Qasem Soleimani, whose assassination the Trump administration has publicly taken credit for. Now, for its part, Iran announced today that it's finally pulling out of the 2015 nuclear deal it signed with the United States, the one that Mr. Trump decided to renege on almost immediately after getting into office. Countries around the world, including most of Europe, have tried to placate Iran, to tell them to please stay in. And it seemed for a while to be working, interestingly enough, until now. And tonight, 
There is another major repercussion from the U.S. assassination of Iran's top commander. Neighboring Iraq, a country that, by the way, used to be Iran's mortal enemy, mortal enemy, is picking sides in this brewing war between the United States and Iran, and the side that it has picked appears to be Iran. Iran. And see, this Iraq and Iran, they kind of had a little beef. Uh, the Shias and the Sunnis, because um, the Shias, which is um, Iran, and the Sunnis, which is um, Iraq, okay, one, they, they, they got like a religion, um, um, it's like a religion divide between um, Muhammad and Islam, because the Persians saying Muhammad, they got some situation going on between them. Between the two, Iran being the Shias and um, Iraq being the, Sun the Sunnis, because of their religion with, with Islam, because because uh, the Persians, the Iranians, saying that Muhammad was first from Persia, but then you got Iraq saying that no, he was first with uh, from their side. So it's a religion thing going on. But now they have joined together to go against um, U.S. man. In fact, today, the Iraqi parliament approved a resolution to expel 5,000 U.S. troops from Iraq. They're saying, we want you out of here. Now, here's what's really weird about this story, okay? You ready? Upon hearing of this, President Trump tweeted out that U.S. troops would not leave. He said, we're not leaving Iraq. Sorry. And the reason why is because um, it, it's a lot of military bases in Iraq, man, okay? They got a lot of military, U.S. military bases over there. So, <clears throat> this is what Trump's saying. Even if you want us to go, I don't care. We're not leaving unless you, Iraq, pay us back for all the military bases that we installed there. But just a couple of hours ago, we heard from U.S. military commanders in Iraq, who it appears did not read the president's tweet, or maybe didn't care. They announced, again, just a couple of hours ago, just the opposite of what the president tweeted. Quote, this is from the U.S. military commander in Iraq. He says, we respect your decision to order our departure and will be repositioning forces over the course of the coming days and weeks to prepare for onward movement. That's military jar jargon for, okay, we get the message. You don't want us, we're going to get out of here. In the next days or weeks, he says. In other words, after costs of nine trillion dollars let me say that again nine trillion dollars over several decades in iraq the u.s seems poised to turn the country over to iran which is by the way exactly what really smart people warned would happen if we invaded iraq almost 30 years ago in 1991 this is the news with rick sanchez where we believe it's time to do news again. Okay, here's the list of the questions that you're going to be asking tomorrow. What happens when U.S. troops finally abandon Iraq? Iran poised to seek vengeance for the killing of its leader. But how and where? Did the man appointed by the United States to be Venezuela's president really try and climb his way into the legislature? Well, we're going to go ahead and begin our A block tonight with what appears to be a case of the left hand not quite knowing what the right hand is doing when it comes to U.S. foreign policy. Iraq says... Following the U.S. assassination of Iraq, so Iran's top commander, Qasem Soleimani, that U.S. troops must leave their country. Again, this is Iraq and their parliament deciding the United States must go. Mr. Trump says it isn't going to happen unless Iraq pays for it. But much like the wall in Mexico, it appears Iraq didn't get the message because they're not going to pay. Because, in fact, like I said just a couple of hours ago, U.S. military commanders are saying <clears throat> they will pull out of Iraq in the next couple of uh, days and weeks. Joining us now, former governor of Minnesota and Navy SEAL, Jesse Ventura, who also hosts the world, uh, according to uh, Jesse, 
right here on RT. Uh, I don't even know where to begin with this. I'm confused, and I follow these things all the time. And I know you're extremely frustrated both about Iraq and what's happening now in Iran. How do you put these two together, Governor? Well, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's total craziness. You're looking at a fact of what has happened to the Constitution, in my opinion, in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. It's clear that the president and all our federally elected officials, they take an oath to it, but that's all they do, because all they do is seem to want to break it. Now, the president's up for, to be uh, taken out of office based upon the fact, one of the facts that he broke the Constitution by seeking help from a foreign country to get reelected. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, that's nothing compared to this. Mm -hmm. We now assassinate a high-level ranking officer in another country's military without a declaration of war? What happened to declaring war? That's why this is indeed an assassination. This because we haven't declared war against Iran. We've and all... yet we can kill kill one of their top ranking military officers because the president says so, which totally violates the Constitution of the United States. You're not supposed to be able to go out and assassinate people of another military without a declaration of war. Where's Congress on this? You seem angry, Governor, but let me ask you another question about what we learned today. And this appears really curious. You know, we have already spent $2 trillion in Iraq, and we owe another 6 to $7 trillion. By the wow. way, I say owe oh, because most of the money for the war in Iraq was borrowed from China. <laughs> but what's interesting oh, about this man. is now it appears, at least, that we're getting ready to head out, uh, that we're just going to take all our 5,000 troops that remain there and leave and essentially give it to Iran. You know, and I know, that everybody said if you go into Iraq in the first place, it'll end up in the hands of Iran, right? Ab absolutely, you know, you go back. Saddam Hussein was a minority in charge of Iraq. Yeah. His enemy was Iran. Well, when we went in and took out Saddam, the majority of the people in Iraq are the same religion as the ones in Iran. Yeah. Right. So the majority then took over. So that opened the gate. Rick, that shows me this was all planned going all the way back. And I'm going to say it with 9-11 and the whole thing. You look at what's gone on in Afghanistan. They lied completely about that war. They lied again about weapons of mass destruction, ties to Al-Qaeda. They're saying this guy was now going to lead some imminent attack on the U.S.? Well, how could just taking him out stop that? If the attack is going to be that big, what was he going to do? Wrap himself up in dynamite and run into a big building? No. He's going to lead some type of military attack against us, and by simply taking him out, that's going to stop the attack? I, you know, I don't I, think I, so. I, I We're setting up right now to go to war. I understand your political That's facts. What it is, man. Sir about the fact that we have stupid politicians we always and you heard it right out of the horse's mouth man okay just ventura man hey he's setting up to go to war man hey this is the spirit of yahweh by shimia was shot man he's gathering these nations joel three and nine man okay down to 14 man he gathering them to go into the valley of yahweh shapat man okay the valley of decision man and hey, this is what i'm a getting man okay <clears throat> This is the, what is it, the mountain of the troops? Hey, World War Three, man. Okay? The second war is passed, Revelation 11 and 14, man. And here come another war shortly hereafter, man. Always have. Kind of goes with the term, right? But I'm kind of taken aback that our military, the guys at the Pentagon, would agree to what you just said. Assassinate what is essentially a foreign leader using our missiles. That does seem a little queer, a little strange, doesn't it? Well, and the thing is about this, everything we've done since the Trump administration has gotten in there has been directed at getting Iran in a fight with us. Mm -hmm. We pulled out of the uh, nuclear deal. We've been doing everything we can, poking them, doing this, doing that to them. And now this is like the, the big one. We take out and you see what happened over there. Iran was a country that was divided. They have a lot of people there that want a new regime. But by doing what we did, we've solidified them now. Mm. Any chance of a regime change there, in my opinion, is dead in the water. Yeah. Because they all got a new enemy now. It's us. 
And, you know, we're out there now starting another war. We've been at war since for 20 years now, and now we get to continue. What you got here, too, is the example of when you got a draft dodger who runs the military, this is the result you're going to get, where one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. I haven't seen you this fired up in a long time. Jesse Ventura, thank you, my friend, for uh, doing this appearance for us on the well, show, sharing some of your... I think we're... Hey, Rick, we're at, a, we're at a point right now. We're on the verge of war. I get fired up on that. And you should, like any American. Thank you, uh, Governor. We appreciate your time. So what now? Will Iran strike back at the U.S. interests in the region? And if so, how? I'm going to show you a couple of key maps here. I think this is uh, illustrative for us to be able to examine. The first one, as you can see right here, it shows where Iran has assets in place. You see those places? These are militias. These are people who are beholden to Soleimani. They love the guy, and they're there, right? They're in Pakistan. They're in Afghanistan. They're in Iraq. They're in Syria. Uh, see right there? They're in, uh, what is that, Lebanon, right? Palestine, Yemen. Uh, look at all those, that quandary of countries where Iran how had interests and now has more interests, right? And with news that Iran has chosen to restart its nuclear enrichment program, I want you to take a look at another map that we put together for you that we want to show you. Okay, let's broaden this out a little bit, and then you're going to be able to see those lines. All right, I'm going to take you through this, right? This is the reach of its missiles. The broken line that you see, the very first one inside the red line right there, that's Iran's missile defense system, right? The purple line after that, uh, that represents their Kiam missiles, and you can see the countries that it reaches right there. Obviously, some very important countries that are, you know, there's reasons to be concerned about, right? The blue line represents the Shahab 3 missile, and then you see the red line, and that one, by the way, reaches all the way into Israel, for example, and other countries. And then the, uh, the, the big one is the red line. It goes all the way out to places like India and Russia and <clears throat> other parts of Africa as well. So joining us now is former Pentagon official uh, Michael Malouf. We, we show those because we think it's important to just show the fact that this is a country that has a real military and uh, they can do some damage. Now, that said, you don't think that they're going to use a conventional approach to retaliate, do you? No, I do not. I think that um, they're going to be, they're going to lie in wait. They are going to uh, uh, use indirect means uh, I think this is a, a golden opportunity for them, uh, whether you believe it or not, given that we're almost on the brink of war. But they could leverage us and uh, and our allies, particularly, to, to, um, <laughs> to, to back them and, and, and isolate the United States because no one w approved of what happened. To leverage someone. their victimhood. That's correct. Yeah. Leverage that. Or the leveraging would be, uh, alternatively, mine the harbor, mine, mine the, uh, uh -huh. the uh, Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz, which would uh, th literally overnight create a major depression. Here's what I'm hearing from a lot of people who seem to be real smart on this, like yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is that what Iran, a country that's been around for 5,000 years, these are really smart people. They invented math over there, okay? Mm -hmm. These are no dummies. Very sophisticated people. They're going to do whatever they can to nick and prick at U.S. interests abroad. Our economy, our infrastructures, our allies, etc., etc. Without actually, the Hebrew Israelites created everything. Everything. Okay, they didn't create no math. Us even knowing that they did it. That's correct. Am I wrong? No, no, you're not wrong. They're going to be. They're going to use indirect means they know that a, a direct military confrontation will bring annihilation they know that but they they know we're all powerful so they're going to try other means they're going to be working with uh, the government of iraq for example to try and kick us out mm -hmm. uh, th as an update on that uh, the secretary of defense has repudiated what the general general uh, did oh you really yeah he has he has tonight he repudiated that says we're not leaving and I might add that the parliament was only Shia voting, and it didn't include Sunnis or, or, or Kurds. And as a consequence, uh, the, the prime minister will have to sign off on, on what the uh, parliament did, which is predominantly yeah, but, but Shia. But let me, let me just stop you for a minute. Your, yeah. your, your guy worked in the Pentagon. 
Mm -hmm. you, you've got to be frustrated by this. Oh, the yeah. president says one thing. The commander says another thing. Now the uh, sec defense uh, has to pop in and say another thing. And as an American, I'm sitting here saying, who do I believe? What well, the hell is going on? This letter was signed by a brigadier general. It was unsigned. I should say it was unsigned, sent to the uh, prime minister of Iraq. Now the question is, how in the world did he get that? And, and was unsigned. And General Milley tonight, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, repudiated that letter and, re and said it was only a draft and it was not meant to go out. That's where we are right now. It, it's very confusing. Yeah, it's very I know. Confusing. And especially, I imagine, for a guy like you, who's usually an oh, totally orderly man, to say the very least, since you've been in the military. Hey, one last thing. There, there's this... I, I mentioned all these rockets and missiles that Iran has. There's one other. I think it's called the Samar missile. Mm -hmm. And it has the capability, as crazy as this sounds, of actually going into outer space, which then would increase their range. Right. Is, there, is there any... Uh, well, the, the, the uh, Iranians have a space program. Uh, they have a space agency. They have launched a few satellites. Uh, the State Department has already sanctioned it, claiming, and Pompeo has also claimed that that, that system for a space program is really a cover to test ballistic missiles, long-range ballistic missiles. So we have sanctioned that. Their, their satellite mm. program is, is a utter failure. They have not really uh, been able to... But, so, but some would say, Michael, who would blame them after we just assassinated one of their leaders? Well, they're going to keep, they're going to continue, but given their economic situation right now, I don't think that's their highest priority. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, as usual, Michael Malouf, great Pleasure. conversation. Thanks. You see, what's going on? I'm happy is, man. North America going to be destroyed. Economically, man. Okay. Hey, they gonna starve North America out, man. Okay. Hey, they gonna hey when they once they join together, all these allies of North America separate and they join amongst themselves, man. They gonna starve this place out, man. Cause most of the food that that come to North America, man, coming from other countries, man. Okay. They gonna starve this place out, man. Economically, man. Okay, it's gonna starve out, man. From the inside. These people. Hey. The least of the flock should draw them out man. And that's what's going on. These things is going back and forth. They're going back and forth. These countries. Okay. This is this is all done from Israel man. Okay. It's these Israelis man. They drawing North America out. To do these things man. It's prophecy though. It got to happen. So Lord with those edifying. Got to give all praise on their glory. To Yahweh, Bahashim Yahweh Shah, Bahashim Rekah Kodash, the bonus to the apostles and elders of great millstone who are well, who teach well, and the sense of salutations, all that I can push in this truth and believe in this truth throughout the four winds of the earth, the entire world working up the hope for the elect. And shalom to the wife who are listening and learning, the few sisters who are listening and learning. The Lord will us edifying. Hey, the least of the flock shall draw them out, man. Those Israeli Edomites is going to draw these North American Edomites over there. In that land, barren and desolate. Okay? Shalom.